The perspective of functionalism, and especially as we'll talk about its relation with artificial intelligence, provides us with a perspective for thinking about the mind and our mental life that is uh, actually very different from both of the perspectives we looked at last week of dualism and physicalism. And we, we talked last time about whether either of those perspectives are really um, are really adequate to, to sufficiently capture our intuitions of, about the kind of theory we need of, of the mind and our mental life and the way that it works. In fact, it maybe will we'll want to say that perhaps no theory can fully and satisfactorily capture everything that is important about our, our mental life. Perhaps, um, perhaps we just don't have a theory to do that. But functionalism is is an interesting example because it arose um, uh, about 40 years or so now. It started to come to prominence, started to become um, something that a lot of a lot of philosophers were talking about and, and taking up. And of course, it's been linked. It's very closely linked with um, other researchers in the area of, of artificial intelligence. So functionalism is is a a theory in the philosophy of mind about how the mind is and the way that it works. And artificial intelligence is a that, as as the book distinguishes, there's a strong artificial intelligence thesis and a and a narrower thesis. Um, whereas the narrower thesis would would be simply that um, machines can a- exhibit some of the features that we associate with intelligence. The stronger view is that we we will, um, if not already, we will be be um, inclined to say at some point in the not too distant future that that uh, computers and other artificial intelligence devices have minds and we'll talk about them as having minds in the same way that human beings have minds. So that's the strong artificial intelligence assumption. And as we'll see, starting from a functionalist point of view on what the mind is and the way the mind works, it opens up the possibility of us talking about artificial intelligence and us talking about machines and computers as having minds. So we'll we'll explore that idea um, this week and we'll, we'll try to talk about functionalism and get a sense of, of how it's different and what makes it a, a unique theory of, of mind and our mental life. And we'll try to say something about how satisfactory it is and what its weak points are. Um, what its weak points are, what things perhaps it, it doesn't capture as well as, as other perspectives. So it, it, it may be that we'll still be sort of left wanting at the end of this week that, that we'll still feel that there are, you know, that there are parts of our mental life that we cannot satisfactorily take account of. Nonetheless, um, this is an interesting perspective from which to, from which to ask this question. And it's also a, a recent theory and an exciting theory because of all the research that's being done in the area of artificial intelligence especially. Now, the first thing, and really let's start with the most simple, the, the most simple aspect of functionalism. As the name suggests, the, the key to it is the idea of function. And when we talk about something having a function, when we talk about something being identified by its function, what we mean is the role that something performs. In other words, what it does, the the characteristic task that it is suited to perform. So let's just think for a minute of everyday kinds of things that we say have functions. And for example, we talk about the function of a knife. If we talk about the function of a knife, the first thing that comes to mind is that it serves for cutting things or dissecting things or however you, however you want to put it. But as we know, and as you can see, a knife is designed specifically to perform that task. It's, it's sharp and it, it has a handle that facilitates um, ease of manipulation, um, typically. So a, a knife is designed in order to be able to, to cut through things, to slice things. The knife has a function, that's what it does. So, we identify a knife, and this would be the, the, the stronger point here, we, we define what a knife is in terms of the function that it performs. 
in terms of its function of cutting, of slicing, um, different things. Now, in the case of a car, if we ask about its function, obviously it serves as a, as a means of transportation. Right? It serves to take us from one place to another. So, if, if we asked, you know, here is, a, here is a car, what is its function, or, or is it a thing that we define in terms of its function, um, I think we would say, yes, we do. We define a car in terms of its ability to transport us from one place to another. And here, of course, it's not the only thing that, that fulfills that function. Um, trains and buses can, can do that too. And of course, one thing we might say here is perhaps that's not the only uh, role of a car. Perhaps it also, for a lot of people, maybe it's a status symbol as, as, as well. And that may be, that may be true. However, the, for it to be a car, and I think I would insist on this, and I think this is important, for it to be defined as a car, it would have to be something that is capable of transporting us from one place to another. So that's what makes it a car, that's what makes it fit this particular description. And finally, the heart has a function too. The function of the heart is to circulate blood within the body. So here is, here is an organ that, that is identified by Again, it's, it's function in maintaining the, the organic system that is the human body, or you know, the body of any other, um, any other creatures that, that also possess this particular, this particular functionality. So the heart is something that we can identify by what it does. <clears throat> we can identify by the role that it plays within the, within the bodily system. Okay, it, it pumps and circulates blood. So, at an everyday level, we do think about things and we do define things by the functions that they perform, by the typical um, functions that they have. And we, we can see that, you know, we, we start noticing that everywhere once we, once we see the, the way that we talk about things, that identifying things in terms of functions is, is a really important part of how we identify what things are. Now, so, let's talk a little bit more specifically then about the idea of mental states as functions. Okay, mental states as functions. As the idea suggests, the basic idea, again, is that we identify a mental state by the role that it plays, by the function that it performs. So, rather than sort of seeing it in terms of its underlying physical system, um, we're seeing the mental state, we're talking about mental states, our thinking, our, our, um, our wishing, um, our desiring, our emotions, and so on. We think about all of these mental states in terms of, of the role that they play, in terms of what they do, in terms of, of the function that they perform. Okay, so Let's take as our example the, um, the function, or the, let's say the mental state, I am in pain. And we ask, well... If we're going to look at it from a functionless point of view, what is the function that is performed by this mental state? What role does it play um, in our system? What is the characteristic function performed? What sorts of typical behavior does it give rise to? And, you know, the simple but an interesting answer is pain behavior. In other words, it, it gives rise to, and let's make that more interesting by spelling it out, it gives rise to the sort of behaviors that are characteristic of somebody who is in pain, right? So, when somebody says, I am in pain, when somebody says, you know, this is my, um, this is my state of mind, I am in pain, um, the awareness of being in pain, we would expect certain characteristic um, behaviors or actions to follow, certain, ca certain characteristic types of effects to follow from the statement that somebody has in pain, is, is in pain, depending on what kind of pain it is, of course, we would expect them to be, you know, um, perhaps hunched over, sitting a certain way, if it's severe pain, clutching a certain part of their body, if it's in a certain location, we would expect them to be um, perhaps rubbing that, that location, perhaps resting that location, perhaps if it's sort of, you know, the immediate pain of, of you know, I, I've put my hand in the fire, we would expect the awareness that I am in pain to give rise to, you know, the immediate action of moving one's hand away. So the statement that I am in pain 
can be characterized by a certain function, which is certain types of behavior which seek to, which seek to respond to pain in a certain bodily location. So it gives rise to typical behaviors, typical behaviors that we would call, you know, typical pain behaviors. So the mental state plays a role. In other words, it, it directs us to do certain things, to avoid certain other things, and to, to behave in certain characteristic ways, right? To avoid certain things, to hold ourselves a certain way, to assume a certain position, to, um, to make certain pronouncements such as, ouch, or this hurts, or whatever. But the, there are typical behaviors associated with, with this mental state. And functionalists argue that all mental states can be characterized this way. Now, the idea of multiple realizability tells us that a thing, if it has multi multi multiple realizability, it can be embodied or, as we can also say, instantiated in many different media or many different forms. Embodied or instantiated means it, it can be sort of realized in different ways. Let's just figure that out by, by looking at some examples. And functionalists will tell us that all mental events possess this property of multiple realizability. All mental states are, are realizable, in other words, in, in multiple different ways, in many different media or different forms. What we mean when we talk about multiple realizability if you think of you know ordinary um, everyday activities or ordinary everyday things, like the act of getting to work or school, right? We all perform this activity every day of, of getting to work or getting to school. We all do it probably in different ways. E each of us has has a different way of doing it. Maybe you know we we sort of uh, maybe some of us come on the subway. Uh, maybe some people walk, some of us take the bike, some of us take the subway and then take the bus, um, or the other way around. But that activity can be realized in multiple different ways. And sometimes some of us are lucky enough that we can choose um, what method we'll, we'll use on a given day, what the way in which we'll realize that activity. Perhaps when it's sunny, we'll walk. If it's raining, we'll take the bus. Um, so we, we, can, we can figure out, we can realize that thing in different ways, that activity. Same as telling the time. There are different different ways of realizing the, the activity of telling the time. We can use an analog device, obviously we can use a digital device, we could use a sundial. So there are, again, there are many different ways of performing that activity satisfactorily, um, of, of, of making, of, of, of successfully realizing that idea. And the third, which is not an activity but a thing, when we talk about something as being a seat, um, what makes something a seat? Well, you know, if, if we walk into a room and we see a chair, we identify that as a seat. But a chair isn't the only thing that can serve as a seat. Um, you know, we can, we can sit on a bench, um, you know, we can sit on a raised concrete block, we can sit on a stoop outside of our house. Different things can, can serve that function for us, depending on you know, the context and the, the terrain or whatever. Different things can serve the function of, of being a seat. That idea, that thing, can be realized in many different ways. So when we talk about multiple realizability and we talk about it being a thing can be embodied or instantiated in, in different media, that's, that's what is meant by that idea that there are many different ways of realizing a certain thing or a certain idea or a certain activity. There are many di different ways of fulfilling the meaning that is in that thing, either the idea of a seat or telling the time or whatever. Okay? And functionalists are going to argue that that is characteristic of all of our mental, of all of our mental states, that they can be realized in different ways. Now this idea is, is absolutely crucial for seeing why functionalism is different from physicalism. And we'll talk about that in, in a second. That according to the idea of multiple realizability, for functionalism, if it holds, the physicalist perspective must be, has to be deficient in some way if multiple realizability is true. 
to think about why that's so and why this idea is, is so important, think about, let's use this example as an example of that. <clears throat> Suppose that there were, in fact, um, beings that, let's call them Martians, from another planet, from the planet Mars. Suppose that they were beings that could do similar things to us. In other words, they could perceive, they could wish, um, they could express different um, emotions, they could say, I am in pain, and point to a certain part of their body and say, ouch. However, let's suppose that they were, instead of being based like us on the elements of carbon, like us human beings and other life forms on this earth, suppose that they were based on the elements of silicon instead. Okay. Now, this is a pure philosophical hypothesis. In other words, there's no, um, obviously, there's no um, experimental evidence to suggest how that would work. All that we're doing here is, is, is suggesting a, a thought experiment. Let's suppose that that is true. And suppose we agree that it's not sort of beyond the bounds of scientific possibility. In other words, even though it, it doesn't exist, we can't sort of rule it out because of the scientific knowledge that, that we have. And the question we want to ask, let's suppose that's true, the question we want to ask is, would we say that these alien beings had minds? Right? If they could do these things, but they were based on a completely different sort of physical mechanism. Than let's use a different example now and see, see if this sort of looks at the um, attacks physicalism from a different point of view. Is it true that animals feel pain? Do animals feel pain? Research does in fact suggest that the physical chemical embodiment of pain is not exactly the same across different species. Not exactly the same across different species, meaning that it's a different sort of, it's either a different location or a different um, a different way of transmitting pain or a different way of registering pain in the central nervous system, but it's not the same across creatures. <coughs> that means that if we agree, and I think it would be it would be hard for us to dispute that animals do feel pain to some degree. That's not to say they they have the same awareness that human beings have that they they would be able to say I am in pain but that they certainly exhibit you know characteristic kinds of pain behavior they behave in certain ways in response to certain injuries okay so the embodiment of pain is is not the same now let's consider how this example and also the the previous thing we looked at the Martians idea how those two things might pose a problem, and a serious problem for mind-brain identity theory. What they suggest is, is that this mental state, this mental event of being in pain, of having the awareness I am in pain, can be embodied in many different physical systems. So it's impossible for us to say that there is one single physical state which would correlate with, which would be identical to, this particular mental state, I am in pain, right? So there are many different physical ways, many different underlying physical ways of realizing that state, I am in pain, whether, you know, hypothetical, the Martians based on silicon, or, you know, based on research about, about animals and their susceptibility to pain and the different physical makeup. There are different physical ways, potentially, in, and in fact, actually, of realizing the the awareness or the, the typical mental state, I am in pain, if we believe that, in fact, um, animals do feel pain. So that's the problem for a mind-brain identity theory, that that mental state can be realized in many different physical, um, physical systems, so there cannot be a one-to-one -one identity between a mental state and a particular physical state. The physical state can be different, just like, you know, we can get to work in different ways, um, the bus or the subway, there, there can be many different underlying physical forms to realize a mental state. So that's the core of the difference between functionalism and the theory of physicalism. So let's just sum that up and we'll say that what these examples suggest is that the mental state is the kind of state that it is independently of any particular 
physical realization of that state. Now, bear in mind and notice here very important that it's not a it's not a return to dualism. In other words, it's not saying that the mental state is independent of of any physical state of, of every physical state. It's saying that it's independent of any particular physical realization of that state. So a mental state can be embodied or instantiated in different ways. There has to be an underlying sort of physical system. However, that physical system can change according to the way that, that one can make, one can realize that mental state and what it characteristically does. Just like, you know, your um, the, the, the ability of something to function as a way of getting to work, as a mode of transportation, um, the, the, the ability of something to function like that depends upon what, what it means to be a mode of transportation. So similarly, what it means to be in pain, what it means to be somebody who is in pain, determines the kind of ways that, the different sorts of ways that that, that idea can be realized physically. So. This is the key idea why functionalists insist that we have to understand mental states in terms of the role they perform, rather than the underlying physical state through which they happen, in a particular case, to be instantiated. Now, if we look at the functionalist view of the way that our our mental life works and it's it's interrelation with other things. Functionalists gener generally talk about at the simplest level these three components. That what makes something a mental state is its relation between these three things. So we have sensory inputs and their relation to other mental states. And finally the, the relation of those mental states to particular actions and responses. And in fact there's a um, there's a circular nature to this to this diet to this diagram so that um, changes in action and response will have a, a converse effect on on the types of sensory inputs so that depending on how you respond you will then gather um, additional sensory inputs which will lead to other mental states and so on. So the way to understand the mental state for functionalism is to understand its relation with these three things. In, in other words, what kind of sensory inputs does it characteristically derive from? Right? What types of things are, are likely to trigger it? Secondly, what other mental states is it typically associated with? Right? Does, it, does it tend to follow from other kinds of mental states? And thirdly, what sorts of actions or responses does it typically give rise to? As we saw in the case of, of pain, there are very characteristic behaviors, characteristic responses which follow from the, the consciousness, the awareness that I am in pain. Right? And of course, very characteristic sensory inputs um, that, that we can perceive and feel and so on. Characteristic inputs also contribute to that state. So we have to look at these three things and, and how they interrelate. And the relation between these three um, sums up the way that a particular mental state works, according to functionalism. So it, it derives from sensory inputs, it leads to other characteristic mental states, or, it, or it, it follows from other characteristic mental states, it has a relation to other states, and thirdly, it gives rise to particular actions or responses. Now let's think for a minute about, on this view and on the, on the functionalist idea of the mind in terms of the functions that mental states perform, let's just think for a minute about what might be a problem for functionalism. And it's a problem which, which I think we should think about not for its own sake, um, it's a sort of hypothetical problem, the inverted spectrum problem, not simply for its own, s own sake, but perhaps for a light that it sheds on a, a more generally perceived weakness of functionalism. So let's talk about the, the idea of an inverted spectrum, and then we'll, we'll, ju we'll draw the more general criticism that, that we want to work towards here. So let's suppose that a person is born with a condition which makes us see the opposite spectrum of light that is normally perceived. Okay. In other words, 
it's a it's not a colorblind person. It's a person that sees exactly the the same discriminations of between different different colors, between lights of different um, of different frequencies that any other normal person perceives. The only problem, the only difference, is that this person's spectrum is inverted. In other words, instead of sort of starting at, at one end and, and ending at the other, it starts. It starts at, at the other end and then goes from from dark to light or from light to dark. So it, it's an inverted spectrum. It's an inverted spe colored spectrum in which all of the differences between different between the different wavelengths is is maintained. And the question is, how would we how would we know this, or how how would we be aware that a person has this inverted spectrum? Let's suppose that. The normal person would see here an orange ball, right? In other words, if you have a non-inverted spectrum, a normal spectrum, then you would perceive an orange ball and, and you call it orange. Now, for a person with an inverted spectrum, that person would see a blue ball. However, that person wouldn't, the person with the inverted spectrum, wouldn't call it a blue ball. Because, of course, everybody else calls it an orange ball. So, if you have an inverted spectrum, you would call this orange. But instead of seeing orange, you would see blue. And, of course, when other people see blue, you would see orange. But you would call it orange. Right? So, the person sees, and when, when you have an inverted spectrum, it maintains the discrimination. Right? You see exactly the same color discriminations. However, you see different colors. Right? You see a different scale of colors. So instead of, sort of calling this ball orange, you would call it blue. Right? Or vice versa. Okay? So the question is that, and here's why it's a difficulty for functionalism. You would never know that a person has an inverted spectrum. Right? Because that person would react presumably in precisely the same ways to colors that we, us without inverted spectrums, if that holds of all of us, of course, we, that person would, would, would exhibit precisely the same behaviors that we would see when, when we react to colors. If you say, fetch me an orange ball, that person would go fetch an orange ball, right? Except they would see the ball as blue rather than as orange, okay? So, the reason I said that this leads us on to a, a more significant issue is, is that what this is really getting at is really the idea of, of the sense to us or, or this subjective feel of our mental states, right? How they feel to us. Now, because functionalism is a theory that looks at mental states in terms of the role that they play, it's the kind of theory that does have an issue with giving a, a good explanation of, of what our states feel like to us, of what it means, of what it feels like to be in a particular state, right? And pain is, is another good example of that, that, you know, sure, we can say pain gives rise to characteristic sorts of behaviors and responses. However, we also, all of us know, that being in pain also feels a certain way, right? It has a characteristic feel to it. We, we we are in a certain mental condition. We're in a certain state. We feel a certain way. We have a certain subjective feel about us when we're in pain. And the question is whether functionalism can adequately account for that part of what mental states are like. In other words, how they feel to us, their subjective quality. So here's the thing. Functionalism here would be unable to distinguish the difference in quality between the sensations of a person with inverted spectrum and a person with the non-inverted, in other words, the normal way of perceiving color. So the difference in quality here, whether one sees orange or blue, and, and how that feels and looks different, functionalism would have no way of accounting for that subjective, qualitative sort of feel to a mental state. And whether, that, whether we think that's a problem, of course, depends upon how important that sort of sense of feel is to a mental state. And in some cases it may, we may want to say it's very important indeed. So that's the problem. 
Now let's switch gears to look at the idea of artificial intelligence and we'll, we'll explain especially how this links together with functionalism and, and the, the sort of um, the cross the cross fertilization between the two that they both tend to support each other and the question we're interested in here is could computers have cognitive states that would be functionally equivalent to the mental states of human beings okay so could they have cognitive states that would be functionally equivalent to the mental states of human beings would they would they have the same relations between inputs other mental states and behaviors now on the f one way we can really see the connection between the functionalist model and, uh, and artificial intelligence is if we look at the idea of hardware and software and we try and think about minds based on this idea of hardware and software okay we're all familiar with these terms I think that if, if we understand that the software as the programs and the hardware as sort of the physical infrastructure now, if we think of, of our mental life on the model of hardware or software, it's clear that in our case the hardware would be, you know, in large part the brain. In other words, it's the physical chemical makeup of the brain, the organ in our skulls that allows us to um, allows us to do certain types of mental things, to think, to calculate, to to emote, to experience emotion, and to to wish and to dream and so on. So we can understand um, the brain as, as sort of the key hardware that enables us to do those things. Now, in the case of computers, instead of the brain, the the hardware in, in question would of course be, you know, what we ordinarily call the, the computer hardware, the, the, the circuitry, um, the, the microchips, and everything that we can physically see and look at, everything which is sort of sort of physically there that, that we can perceive and look at comprises the, the hardware okay so in the case of whereas in the case of humans the hardware is our brain in the case of computers of course it's it's the physical circuitry and the infrastructure so it's the physical components that make the machine function that's how we want to understand hardware in the case of the computer okay so the, uh, on both of these cases, then, we, we seem to have a, a relation between hardware, a certain sort of physical system or infrastructure, and software, meaning the types of things we can do, the types of programs we can run on the basis of that infrastructure. So for humans, our software, if we can call it that, would be all of the functions that can be instantiated or embodied in the physical system that is the brain. So what kind of things? Well, that would be all of our typical mental life. Thinking, perceiving, speaking a language, experiencing an emotion, etc. Right? Being in pain, all of that stuff. The software would be everything that the physical chemical system of the brain enables us to do. All of those mental states, all of those programs, as by extension we can speak of them, that can be run on the basis of our hardware. Now, in the case of a computer, of course, the software refers to the programs that one can run on the hardware. So, for a computer, the, the typical um, programs, and we're sort of familiar with, with them, um, are the things that a computer can do on the basis of its hardware. What kind of things? Well, we know it can, you know, typical PCs can run uh, word processing programs, photograph processing programs, um, you know, more sort of advanced programs, tax programs, um, it can run games, um, you know, it, it can run sort of um, all sorts of other sophisticated programs, on online downloads and that sort of thing. So there are different, different programs, different things that a computer can do on the basis of its hardware, and that's what we call the software. So on the basis of our comparison here, on the basis of, of our comparison between brains as hardware and sort of computer infrastructure as hardware as, as, as related to different software, meaning the, the typical activities that we can do. Here's the question we, we want to ask here, which artificial intelligence prompts us to 
to ask about, about our, ourselves. Does it make sense to say that we are simply very sophisticated machines who run a series of complex programs on our hardware? Our hardware being the physical chemical makeup of our brain. Is the difference between us and sophisticated computers merely one of degree? In other words, is the difference between us and computers merely that we can run more sophisticated programs? Right? For example, you know, computers can sort of learn a rudimentary language and respond to rudimentary commands um, and you know with a sort of voice activated response they can sort of you know respond to certain voice commands and and certain voice requests and so on um, those things are not very sophisticated now our brains have a language acquisition and language speaking program as well so are we going to say that our language acquisition program is simply more sophisticated? Is it just a more complex program than the, than the system that is run by computers? That's, a, that's an interesting question. One of the things that, that is sort of different here, of, of course, that our brain is just so more um, finely wired and tuned that it's, it, it far surpasses in sophistication and adaptability um, anything of which artificial intelligence systems are capable. I don't want to take that sort of too far because they, there are some advanced sort of AI systems out, out there nowadays who can sort of learn from experience and sort of adjust their behaviors and, and things like that. So we have to be, be careful that we're not sort of knocking down the latest research. However, there is still a greater sophistication about, about the types of um, things that one can do with, with the physical makeup of the brain. Having said that, there, there's also one sort of deficiency, and that's that the software that we can run is, is much more tightly integrated into our hardware. And what I mean by that is that in the case of a computer, it's pretty easy to take out the software. Right? Usually we just go to you know um, add or remove programs, and you can take out a piece of software and put in a latest version or, or put something else into the machine. With our brains, it's not possible to do that, right? You can't take out a language program, say, if we've been speaking French or Spanish from birth, and now we want to put in an English program. Unfortunately, we can't do that, right? We have to completely rewire our brains, or we have to make new connections from scratch in order to do that. So in a lot of ways, our brains are less, are less adaptable. But this does suggest a, an interesting comparison, and you can see the, the connection with functionalism here, because functionalists, remember thinking about function, when we talk about software and software programs, we're basically just talking about things that one can do, or you know, activities that can be performed, um, programs that can be run using software. So for functionalists, you know, our, our, the mental state of being in pain is like a program that we're running. When we say, I am in pain, it's like we're running a program that leads us to do certain things, avoid other things, behave in certain characteristic ways. And we can see the, the um, I think we can see the attraction of that, even if it, some of the things about it may, make, may unsettle us a little bit. We might want to say, well, that's not all there is to it. But of course, the difficult question is, well, what else is there? Right, how do we how do we give expression or pin down exactly what it is that is supposed to be lacking from the functionalist or the artificial intelligence points of view? Now, Alan Turing, a famous uh, mathematician, proposed a test that became known as the Turing test. And the Turing test is what's known as an operational definition for intelligence. Operational meaning that it you have to perform a certain thing, and if, if you fulfill the operation successfully, if you can do this thing, then, then you should be um, defined as being an intelligent being. Okay? So it's, it's basically a test for, uh, for artificial intelligence. It's, it's generally, um, generally people are, are attracted to the test because of its simplicity, and there's actually still a competition each year, I think, at MIT, where different sort of machines um, compete to be the most sort of sophisticated device. None has sort of passed the test as of yet, but there are different degrees of sophistication. So the key idea is that you, you ought to communicate behind a screen with 
real persons and an artificial intelligence program. It might be that you know you 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 have a number of different communications, or it may be that it's just one, but you don't know whether it's a real person or an artificial intelligence program. Now here's the operational test. If you, sitting behind your sort of curtain, sitting behind your screen, if you cannot tell the difference between which is which, between the computer and a real person, if, if you can't say that it's definitely one, that it's you know definitely artificial intelligence, then the computer, if it is a computer you're communicating with, ought to be judged intelligent, right? In other words, the, the idea is, if it has a degree of sophistication such that you can't tell whether it's human or whether it's artificial intelligence, just call it intelligent, right? Just just say that it possesses the, the characteristic of, of exhibiting intelligence, okay? Like I said, no... Um, nothing has yet sort of passed the test, although there are different prizes given out every year for the most sophisticated machine. So this is um, th this is a widely held operational test for intelligence. Now, John Searle proposed. John Searle is a longtime philosopher at Berkeley, um, at the University of California proposed a, a an idea called the Chinese Room. And the Chinese Room, in essence, is a critique of thinking about the idea of intelligence as the Turing test thinks about it. And, it. and it really says that even if a computer passed the Turing test, we wouldn't be able to confirm that it was intelligence. In other words, passing the Turing test would not be a necessary definition of intelligence. Now, Searle's argument the Chinese room is, is important more broadly, I think, because it, it suggests a broader critique of the whole program of artificial intelligence. And what Searle really wants to say is that artificial intelligence programs really are, are things that could merely simulate intelligence. In other words, they, they give the impression to simulate. They, they look like they possess intelligence. They may behave as though they possess intelligence, but they don't really possess intelligence because they don't understand what it is that they're doing. In other words, for Searle, what makes us a human intelligence different from anything that, that artificial systems could do, um, whether for the, for the present, and I think generally I think Searle thinks that artificial intelligence systems just couldn't, by definition, reach the type of intelligence that human beings have. Machines merely simulate intelligence because they lack the ability of, of understanding that is characteristic of our mental life. So let's try and look at that idea in a little bit more detail. Key to the concept and key to the way that artificial intelligence falls short, according to Searle, is the idea of intentionality. To understand intentionality, think about how our mental states have a certain content and how that content has a certain meaning for us. For example, let's think about the content associated with my thought of the Empire State Building. Now, let's just, let's just dwell on this a second. My, my thought of the Empire State Building, to say it has a content, means that there is something to which the thought refers, right? And it's, it's this building, right? It's the building that <coughs> is, you know, a particularly tall building, so-and-so, you know, 100 feet high, whatever, um, in midtown Manhattan um, on the east coast of the United States. My thought of the Empire State Building has a content, and, and I'm aware of a certain meaning that attaches to that thought, right? I'm aware of a certain meaning that attaches to that thought. Now, the idea is that even if computers could sort of manipulate manipulate symbols, even if com computers could successfully, um, you know, take symbols and change them into other symbols and manipulate them around, they could never have the intentionality that that is that is characteristic of thought, and that's what the Chinese room argument ex really illustrates that. If you're in a Chinese, uh, what's called the Chinese room, where notes are being passed under the door in Chinese, you look up in a rule book, 
and then sort of pass another number of uh, other symbols under the door. You can do that, but you don't understand what it is that you're doing. In other words, you don't understand that you know the note you've passed under the door in response to you know looking in the rule book actually means how are you doing today. You don't understand the content, the meaning that attaches to the symbols that you manipulate. And for Searle, and I think we can see the the attraction of what he's saying here. For Searle, that understanding is crucial for the intelligence that, that we have and that is crucial to our mental life. And Searle characterizes this idea in terms of intentionality. It's the directedness of our mental states, that we understand that we understand the content that is associated with them and has a meaning for us. So for example, when I have a thought of the Empire State Building, right, there's a meaning, a content that attaches to that thought. It's not simply a set of symbols that I can, you know, build and, and link with other symbols and then associate in different ways. It has a meaning that is this building in midtown Manhattan that's, you know, so and so decades old and so and so feet tall and so on. That I there's a content associated with it. Now, on the basis of, of Searle's critique in the Chinese room, we, we would want to ask we would want to ask the question of whether functionalism is a more adequate theory about our mental life. And I think what Searle's objection to artificial intelligence suggests is, is, is again that if there's a problem it's about what our mental life means to us and how we experience it. In other words that functionalism stresses very, puts a lot of stress on what mental states do, right, the role that they play. Pain in terms of what behavior it gives rise to, what characteristic responses follow from it. However, it doesn't focus a, a lot on, on how our mental states are meaningful to us, how we experience them, the characteristic feel they talked about before that, that they have. So, that's often a critique of functionalism, and I think it's, it's an important critique to bear in mind. So, if we were to say what are the good points about functionalism? I think we would say it avoids some of the problems associated with both dualism and physicalism. Dualism because it doesn't suggest a separate mental substance, separate from the physical. Um, and it avoids problems with physicalism be because it, of its idea of multiple realizability. It recognizes that you know, different mental states can be embodied in different physical systems. And it focuses um, in an interesting way on mental states in terms of the role that they play. Also, as we talked about, it suggests interesting parallels between human intelligence and artificial in forms of intelligence. However, like we said, it has a problem accounting for the subjective feeling that is associated with mental states. For example, what does pain feel like? Is it simply a relation between inputs, mental states and behavior? And again, the, the, the idea here is, is that it, it feels a certain way. There's an experience, an internal experience associated with having a mental state. And by sort of thinking about it in terms of behavior and inputs and outputs, functionalism definitely de-emphasizes that characteristic experience. And I think that, that may be a shortcoming in its view of what our mental life is.